I know Shreger does, obviously. He was there before. Uh, so I come from, like, usually would be snow covered right now. But uh, I don't know if you want to call it global warming or climate change or just a strange winter or what. Uh, the day I left was 77 degrees Fahrenheit, which was the hottest February day ever in Cleveland, Ohio. So a lot of strange things are going on. So which one's the switcher to switch the slides? Oh, so that one, okay. This will go backwards, this will go forward. And that's the laser. Okay. Okay, so like I said, I'm from Ohio, which is right here in the United States. Uh, we're on a big lake, Lake Erie. Uh, it's a nice place. We have four seasons. It seems like you have, what, how many seasons do you have here? Two. Hot and wet, hot and dry? Hot? Okay. Hot and wet. Okay. Okay. So we have four. But anyway, uh, it's a nice place to live. It's a good part of the country. Uh, so, anyway. Okay. Okay, so Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, we're not a real big city. I think we're like 400,000 people. I live outside of it, the country. I drive about 35 minutes into it. Uh, our traffic is nothing like this. This is very different, very, wow. Big eye opener for me, for sure. Okay. Uh, it's a nice city. You might have heard of the Cleveland Cavaliers of basketball. We're the champions. So first time Cleveland's been a champion since 1964. So we were very happy about that. We had big parties and stuff. It was a lot of fun. And Ohio is a very big sports state. So we have our American football, we have our Cleveland Indians, which is our baseball team, Cleveland Cavaliers, and then because we're in Ohio, our biggest college is Ohio State. So that is our, you know, our favorite teams, and we're a bunch of sports fanatics in Ohio, especially football. Football is the king of sports. What's the main sport here? Cricket. Cricket. Cricket's the number one, right? Okay, so I actually work at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Uh, it's a very it's not a very big university. We have actually more graduate students than we have undergraduate students. We are a research institute, and I work in the Department of Ophthalmology doing microscopy. So my job is, especially if you're in eye research, because that's where our funding comes from, and you have a microscope question, you come and see me. And I help you design it, uh, I help you take the images, I help you do the analysis, whatever I have to do. I do a lot of writing. I do a lot of grant writing, I do a lot of uh, fixed papers, I do a lot of other things too. But the thing is, when you're in a core lab, like I am, I have lots and lots of users, okay? So, I don't know how many people are in this room, but I have a lot more users than this, okay? So, I see lots of things. So, it puts me in a pretty good position to uh, see what goes wrong with experiments especially. Because I don't know how much research all of you have done, but a lot of things will go wrong. So, the next lecture, Today I'll talk about some things that go wrong, and hopefully you can learn something from that so you don't make the same mistakes, because I've seen, you can't even imagine how many mistakes. Okay, so this is like a typical day in lab for me. I'm in a little room, I sit in the dark all day. Uh, usually there's a lot of people in there, and we have a couple microscopes going. I use microscopes in other buildings also, so I go around, do different things. But basically that's my office, and I've got like a couple scopes right there with me. Okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, I went to Kent State University. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's in Ohio also. Unfortunately, we're most famous for a shooting that occurred back in the 1970s during the Vietnam War. Uh, students were killed on our campus. And unfortunately, or infamously, that's why Kent State's known for that shooting, actually. I did my PhD on type 6 collagen receptors in the avian cornea. So I looked at chickens. I worked with developing chickens. Uh, a little strange story that happened to me is when you work with developing chickens, you're obviously putting eggs in the incubator all the time. So I write my notebook. I put 12 eggs in today. I put 10 eggs today. You know, 14 eggs, whatever, depending on the experiments. But I come back and be like, there's like four eggs missing, three eggs missing. So I'm thinking, is it me? Am I doing something wrong? What am I doing wrong? But what it was, it turned out the Chinese postdocs were eating all my experiments. Okay? So you never know. Uh, I did three postdocs, 
I did one at the University of North Carolina. I uh, did two other postdocs at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, you also worked at the Cleveland Clinic, right? Yeah. Which is right next to Case, another uh, especially world class in terms of clinical medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, I was a sales rep for two years. I'll talk to you about that towards the end of the course, about what it's like to be on the other side of microscopy, to be on the sales side of microscopy, as opposed to be on the user side. It's a totally different world. Okay? So it makes me sort of well versed to to look at the you know the the technical side of microscopy from a sales point of view, business point of view, and also from a research point of view. I've done them both. Uh, I've been at Case Western Museum for 11 years. Best thing about that, my son went to school there, and because I'm an employee, all his school was paid for. Now I think, do you have to pay here to go to school, or is it free, or how does it work here? You have to pay. You have to pay. Okay. So Case Western is a very expensive school, almost pushing fifty thousand dollars a year. So my son got four years of education for free. So. Worked out really well for you, okay? Uh, and I've actually, not just on microscopy, but I've been working in labs since 1988. So I am your classic lab rat, okay? I've just spent pretty much my, most of my entire adult life in laboratories. So uh, if we get to talk in one-on-one -on -one or as a group, or whatever, feel free to ask me about anything, because I've done an awful lot of different things over the years. Okay, the most important thing is I'm a biologist, okay? And I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a physicist. I mean, you can approach my cross to give me optics, the physics, the math, and there's a lot of that, but a lot of that to me is very confusing, to tell you the truth. So I'm going to try to approach a lot of this from a biology point of view, but unfortunately, some of what we have to talk about does involve math. Just, just a little bit, though, okay? So I won't try to confuse you, but every microscope course I've attended, I've had to or I should say a required part is what we're going to talk about here in a little bit, okay, about how you actually make the image, point spread functions, airy disk. If you want to pay attention, great. If you don't, not really that big a deal. But I'm obligated as teaching a microscope course to talk about it, okay? Even though I really don't myself totally understand it, okay? So keep that in mind. Okay, so like I said earlier in my little introduction, uh, if you want to ask me about anything, feel free. I mean, I want to talk about the United States. The big thing where I work now, obviously, is Donald Trump is our president now, and it's it, that's all we talk about. So, good or bad, however you want to feel about it, don't know what your politics are, but it has become the driving force in America now of just regular conversation. And the news, it's all of us every night. He did this, he did that, he did that. It's just, it's tiring. It's just tiring. He's only been in, what, a month? So, we got a long way to go. Okay, like I said before, I am here for you, so any questions you have, uh, I'll do my best to answer. The other thing about me, I will not make things up, okay? I won't just give you an answer and give you an answer. My first PhD lab I worked in, you know, you just started, you don't know what's going on. Uh, I worked with an advisor, he was a nice guy, but I'd say, hey, how do you, and he'd give me an answer, or how about this? He'd give me an answer. And then after I learned a little more, I realized he really didn't know what he was talking about. But he felt obligated to give me an answer nonetheless. Okay? That's a bad place to be. Because, you know, it's better to say nothing than to, than to say something false. Okay? So I will not do that. If I don't know, I'll tell you, hey, I don't know. Okay? I can't know everything. Nobody does. Okay. So let's first start talking about transmitted light microscopy. So this is probably the stuff you've seen if you've ever looked at just a basic slide, like a like a H and E slide, or you've looked at a like a plant section or something stained maybe green or blue or red. Now, what what we just talked about a little bit ago here, the first lecture was talking a lot about fluorescence. Okay, this is non-fluorescence microscopy. What we're talking about here. Okay, just white white light, transmitted light, bright light, whatever you want to call it. A lot of times I call the technique bright field. Okay. Now, the thing about it is you're shining this bright light through a specimen on a slide, okay? So how do we see it? How does a microscope, what does it do? Why do we need one, okay? Well, I think it's pretty obvious when you think about it. Why do we need microscopes? Well, our eyes only work so well. We can only see things so small, okay? So a little bit about the size of what we can see. We can see like the width of a fine human hair, but other than that, it's just, it's blurry, it's unknown to us. So we need tools, and the microscope, of course, is the tool of choice to see tiny things. So 
so this is something that I have hanging in my lab, actually. Because what it is, is we always talk about sizes. Like here you know, I mean, you guys use the metric system. Okay, you're way smarter in America because we use this silly foot, foot, pound, uh, gallon. Okay, it's math is just, I mean, you, you can't even make things work. Like I have a pool. It's this big by this deep. How much water is in it? You got me. I have no idea. I don't even know how to calculate it because the numbers are so strange. But in metric, you know, it's a system. You know, you guys are all familiar with it. That's what you use. That's what we should use in the United States, but we don't. But we're familiar with meters and, you know, centimeters and things like that. But when you get into the, the tiny world of microscopy, you're not familiar with how big things are. You look under a microscope and you're like, what well, big or it's small? But how big or small is it? So like I said, I keep this chart by me all the time. And I refer to it a lot. Just, you know, if I see something on a slide, I have an idea how big it is. Like a human red blood cell, nine microns across, okay? A normal cell, 10 to 30 microns. Amoebas, this. Uh, frog egg might be two millimeters. And then we get into the, you know, very tiny things, microtubules, nanometers, okay? But it's good to just have an idea when you're looking at things how big they are. And we'll talk later about calibrating a microscope and sizing things using the microscope, but but for the moment it's you know, it's not bad to have a chart like this with you if you're gonna do this kind of work to say, oh yeah, okay, that's about this big, this is about this big. So you have sort of a relationship of how big things are. Okay, this is pretty similar to slide to what we saw just a little bit ago, a different version of it. But again, we're gonna be working here in the light microscope range, in this range, okay? Not as good as electron microscope in terms of resolving very small things and better than the eye at looking at small things, okay? So this is the world we're gonna be talking about for the next six days. Okay, let's go back one. Okay, so I always feel it's important to talk about the, the people that got us here, okay? These scientists that have, you know, come and gone years and years ago, like the men and women who actually did the work that we are now reaping the benefits from. And we touched on this a little bit in the last lecture, but just brief them over a couple of these pretty quickly. Okay, so uh, if you look up the microscope history, okay, uh, we can go back to these two Dutch spectacle makers, Zacharias Jensen and his father, and they were considered to like maybe be the founders of starting microscopes. Okay, Galileo, who you've probably heard of, uh, actually came up the type of compound microscope. He also did telescope kind of things, as you've probably heard. Okay, and then we just talked briefly a little bit about Robert Hooke last time with the cork cells, just, you know, discovering and coining the name cells. And then uh, Anton von Leeuwenhoek, okay, also was involved in this early development of the microscope and was able to see small things like bacteria and such. Okay, so here's like the, you'll have this on your, you have my PowerPoints on your uh, flash drive. So you can take a look over this, and for time's sake, I'm just going to, I'll let you take a look through this because it's just basically a little bit of the history I found of who did what and when they did it in terms of working on an optical microscope. Okay, so Robert Hooke, like we just saw this picture, any microscope course you take, you're going to see this picture. It's just the way it works, okay? Uh, he had this, this type of microscope, very simple, uh, you know, just a lens system to be able to magnify things. And he drew, of course, the cork cells. Okay, Van Leeuwen Hooke, this was a little bit different. This device you see here had like, you put the specimen on this little pin, you look through this hole, and you move that pin back and forth to focus through this hole, which was actually a little lens. Okay, so very simple. Uh, and like we talked about earlier, he saw these animatrules, which basically bacteria and things like that. So it goes way, way back into the, what, 15, 1600s. Okay, so now this is the part I hate to talk about because like I said, I don't understand it perfectly, but I feel obligated teaching you a class that you're at least exposed to this, that you, you hear these words, you hear these terms, that you know any course you take, you're gonna hear this, okay? So what does a microscope do? It creates an image of the object, okay? But it's not perfect, okay? Nothing's really perfect in this world, and the image it creates is not perfect. It has flaws and it has you know things that aren't perfect. So, it's not exactly what you see is what you get. You're getting something near that. You're getting an approximation of what you see. Okay. 
And anything you do, usually, with the microscope, you'll make the picture worse. So if you start flipping around, moving it, whatever, things will usually get worse. The best thing you can do in terms of microscopy, and we'll talk about this at the end when I talk about actually buying your system or buying a you know, microscope setup, is put your money in your objective lenses, okay, which is the lenses you look through. These will literally improve your image. Okay? The better the objective lens, and we'll talk about what that comprises of, the better the image you'll get. Okay? It is the heart of the microscope system, the objective lens. Okay? So getting back to the idea of what is an image, it's an image is where the rays of light that you seem to see have been reflected by a mirror or a lens. Okay? When you see a ray diagram, what we looked at in the last lecture, you see those triangles of light converging on a simple point, a single point. That is, you know, really, really the essence of microscopy, which you're seeing. You're able to focus those rays of light in a place, and you're able to then, uh, you know, resolve them and see the actual image. Okay. So this idea of Eric disk, again, I feel obligated to talk about it. It's not my favorite topic, but we're going to talk about it anyway. Okay. So, I mean, if the room was really, really dark, what I would do... I would take like a card, whoops, excuse me. I would take like a card, like just like a note card like I gave you, and I would put a very, very tiny hole in it, okay? And I would take a very bright light, and I would shine it through that hole, okay? And the light would scatter around the edges of it. So what it is, is you then see this refractive pattern. Like most of the light will go through the middle, but you'll see these refractive rings around it, okay? So this is called an airy disk, okay? This is like a big physics term, uh, optical physics and things like that. Like I said, it, it confused me a little bit, but, but the idea is basically you're gonna see something like this. And like I said, if it was dark, we'd pull out the flashlights and try to make one, but it's not real dark in here, okay? But this is the gist of what an image is on the physics scale. Okay, now I tried to think of a way to explain this. I really couldn't come up with anything good. So I looked around in the literature and dug around, and I came up with this. So feel free to read that, okay? Just take a minute and read it. Let me get out of your way. So basically what we're talking about is we're talking about diffraction. We're talking about light bending. Like when you take a pencil and you put it in a glass of water, and you see that it looks like the pencil's broken, but it's really not because the light travels faster through the air than the water. So you get that, that look of, you know, the pencil looks broken. I think you've all seen that before, right? Okay. Okay, it keeps going on. So you get an interference pattern between these different airy disk. So what an image really is, it's points of light, it's points of these airy disk, it's points of this refraction, okay? And what it is, is then we call this an airy disk, okay? So what a real image is, is it, if we look at it in 2D, it's really thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of these little tiny airy disks overlapping. Okay, in 3D, they would look like this. Okay, like I said, I don't expect you to understand this because I don't understand myself, but if you're a physics guy, you better understand this, okay? Oops, let's go back one. Okay, so like I said, the best thing to resolve these airy disks, the most important thing you can do is you can get a better objective lens, okay? And we'll, I'll harp on this again and again and again and again because if you're looking at something and you want to see the fine detail, you need to use a better lens. And a lot of people come to my lab and, you know, they want to use like a 10x, 20x, and that's fine, 40x, which are all dry objectives. I don't know if, have any of you seen immersion oil objectives on a microscope where you put oil on an objective? Okay. It gets a little messy, but the resolving power of that lens is so much better, you'll see so much more, it's, it's just unbelievable. So it's worth it to, don't be shy when you get on a microscope. Go to the oil version lenses if you want to see some really fine detail. Okay. So, again, the basic ray diagram of a microscope. It's in there. You can take a look at it. And basically what it is, it's just, it's just taking a focal plane and being able to focus it back to your eye. 
Okay. Pretty simple concept, but I mean the physics behind it's pretty intense. Okay, so what it all comes down to is this. It all comes down to resolution. And when I'm talking about the objective, the more money you put in the objective, the better the resolution. So what's resolution? So let's say we're out in outer space, right? And we're coming down here to, and you guys have a lot of trains around here? Trains? Okay. So we've all seen train tracks, right? So if I'm out in outer space, and I'm flying into the Earth, I'm going to see the Earth, you know, it's going to get better and better and better, and I'm going to see a little more detail, a little more detail, a little more detail, and I'm coming here towards India, and I'm looking for train tracks. Well, somewhere out there in space, I'm going to see just a line, right? It, it won't look like train tracks, it'll look like a line. But if I get closer and closer and closer, and my resolution, my resolving power becomes better and better and better, I can actually tell that it's not a line, it's actually two separate tracks, okay? So the whole idea of a microscope is to resolve things, okay? It's not magnification that's important. It's being able to resolve things. And when I say resolve things, it means to be able to distinguish two separate objects from each other, okay? That is what is important. That is the key to microscopy. It doesn't matter how much you blow it up in terms of magnification. Like you can use a, you can buy a little cheap microscope, like a toy microscope, you can have 600 magnification. Well, if you can't resolve anything, if you can't pull two points apart, what have you accomplished? Nothing. You've just magnified a blurry mess, okay? So it all comes down to resolving. Okay. This is very important, but like I said, this is the essence of microscopy. Optical microscopy is the ability to resolve two points. Okay, the math, again, I feel obligated to talk about it. But if you look at all these formulas here for resolution, in terms of math, the wavelength of light, 2NA. Resolution, 0.61 wavelength of light, NA. NA. NA is everywhere, okay? NA is what's known as numerical aperture. Okay? It is the most important thing on a microscope. Okay? When you buy objectives and such, the NA is what you're looking for. The higher the NA, the more you're going to pay for the lens. But it is critical, this idea of numerical aperture, to, to improve resolution. Okay? It's all tied together. Everything in microscopy is a trade off. One thing's better, something's worse. If one thing's worse, something's better. Okay? NA is everything. So when I went to microscope course in Maine a few years ago, I mean, we had t-shirts that said this, okay? Because it is, it is the thing that makes the microscope work, okay? It's just math and physics, but it's the most important thing on the objective. Okay, so a way to look at this is right here. If it says the smaller the NA, the lower the number, the bigger the focal spot. So if we have a small NA, our point spread function is very big. If we have a higher R, higher NA, then our point spread function is very small. Well, if you could put two of these next to each other, you could resolve them. You could resolve smaller things here with the higher NA. As here, it would just look like one object, okay? So again, NA, 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 NA. You're probably going to be tired of me hearing about it pretty soon, but it's the thing you really got to learn. Okay, you pay for it. Okay, I used to be in sales. Okay, I love selling the high NA objectives, okay? Uh, they put more food on the table for me. But, but it helped, it, you know, it, it just made everything better for the researcher too. So it was good for me and it was good for them. It was a win-win situation. Whoops, I gotta use these buttons. Okay, so like I said, the more you spend uh, 8,000 dollar objective for like a 63 oil, you have this on your car focal right now, I have the same one. Uh, you have a 100x oil, probably like a 9,000 dollar objective. Uh, but the dry ones aren't as expensive, they're easier to make, and they don't have the same resolving power. That's the thing. These are not easy to make either. That's part of the reason they're so expensive. So if we take a look at, like right off my microscope here, if we look here, a 5S, 5x objective, look at this big, huge surface, this lens, okay? And here, this is a 10x, this big, huge lens. These are low NAs. A high NA objective has a very steep angle. 
okay? And what you see is you just see like a pinpoint. When you go to the confocal, you'll see these little tiny uh, lenses, okay? But this is a high NA oil objective. Okay, objectives come in different flavors. Uh, they do different things. There's words on the objectives, and it, it doesn't matter so much now. I mean, you're going to use the confocal, the objectives are on there, the objectives are on there. But if you ever go to buy a system, it's good to familiarize, familiarize yourself with what these words mean, okay? And how they fix problems in the optical path. Because, like I said, nothing's perfect. An image is not perfect. But by spending more money on objectives, you can get better images. Okay, so acromats, they're called acromats. They fix a type of aberration, which means a defect, okay? And chroma is color. So these kind of objectives fix color aberrations. Because what will happen, you remember from Roy G. Biv, right? Wavelengths are different, or uh, different colors have different wavelengths. So what will happen is they won't all meet at the same point. Like if you look at something green, it will meet like here. Something red will meet like here. And something blue will meet right here. Well, what an acromat objective does is it fixes that. It allows them all to meet at the same point. So when you look through the microscope, you can see them all at the same point place instead of changing your focus all the time, which is important. Okay. Fluor, fluorite, neofluorite, all these, these are fluorite. They, they correct for uh, fluorite aberrations. These are what you're going to have if you buy a, you know, an objective made for fluorescence. Sometimes you can buy objectives that just are made for looking at surfaces. Like I used to sell industrial microscopes. You have objectives that would just we're really good at looking at something like this, like a surface of a table or a piece of metal or something. There wouldn't be any good for fluorescent microscopy. Okay, so I guess eventually turned to buying a system. And Shreve just just asked me. He was buying a microscope. He ran it past me. He said, "Hey, is this a decent microscope for what I want to do?" So what was the first thing I asked you? I said, "What's your application, right? What are you trying to do? Because I need to know what you're trying to do to determine what's the best thing to buy." Okay, don't let the salesman if you get this position eventually for you. Okay, we'll talk about that at the end. Salesmen are tricky tricky guys. Okay. Uh, okay. APO is an apochromatic correction. Plan just means flat. It makes the entire field flat. And then of course a plan APO would be the combination of these two would fix an apochromatic and a flat correction. Because a lot of times if you don't have this flat correction on an objective, it'll almost look like a like a dome. Or, or concave, like you'll, you'll look and the center will be focused, but the edges will be blurry. Okay, those are non plan objectives. Okay, so again, it comes down to, you know, what you have on your scope, you have on your scope, but, but if you're in charge of buying it, know what you're trying to do, and it's worth learning a little bit more about these kind of things. Okay, again, chromatic aberration, like we just talked about, is the colors all coming together at the same place as opposed to at the wrong place. Uh, Acromatics correct for two colors, usually red and blue, and apochromatics correct for three colors. They're more expensive, but they're nice. Okay, they do the trick. Okay, spherical aberration is when light rays are out of focus, like we were talking about here, where they just don't come into the same spot. They don't focus in the same place. Okay, so we're able to correct for that. Again, a lot of this is optics, physics optics. But again, I feel obligated to talk about it a little bit. This isn't my favorite topic, believe me. Okay, so the one thing to keep in mind here is these objectives are complicated. Okay, there's a lot to them. Like you're just seeing that metal tube on the outside, but there's an awful lot of different kind of lenses and such inside them. And you're probably thinking, how can something that small cost nine, ten thousand dollars? Well, there's an awful lot of engineering and and whatever going into them to get a nice high NA objective. Uh, we used to sell Nikon, we used to sell 1.45 uh, NA objective, which is ridiculously high. The, the people at Nikon that made those, they had to hand make them at the end. It was a three year training program just to learn how to make those objectives. Okay, so this is some pretty serious optics. Okay. But as you can see, there's a ton of glass in these things. The problem with a ton of glass is anytime you have to go through a piece of glass, your amount of light coming through goes down. Okay? Okay. The other thing about the high NA, they let more light through too. Okay. So when you look at an objective, you'll see all these different things on there. Okay? 
and like we just talked about, plan apo, the, the magnification here, 60x. But again, NA, NA, numerical after is what's important when you look at it, okay? So, you know, if you have a chance to use a, a, a 1.2 NA or a, you know, 0.8 NA, use the 1.2 if you can, okay? You'll get more resolution, you'll get more out of it. Okay, so back to the basic microscope. So how many of you have never used a microscope? Just or very, very low on that. Anybody, anybody? Everybody's used them maybe a little bit. I'm thinking through biology classes, you probably use them to look at things. So everybody's probably used one to a little bit. I mean, I guess even a way if you use a magnifying glass, you really use a microscope in a way, okay? Okay, so these are the basic parts. Okay, you're looking through the eyepiece, the objectives, okay? The frame that holds the whole thing together, the focus. Uh, you know, turning the light up and down here. The light coming through the white light, again. Uh, you have diaphragms and condensers, you always little parts. But in general, the design's a little different, but the but this is the gist of it. This is really what you'll see all the time. Okay, so I have all three of these kinds of microscopes in my core. So an upright microscope, as you can see right here, the objectives come from the top. Okay. These kind of uh, microscopes are made to look at slides pretty much. Because you can put the slide there, cover the top, and focus on them right here. Now, inverted microscope, which are really, really common. So what do you think you use an inverted microscope for? Because the light's coming from the bottom. So what do you think the main application is for this? Now, what did you talk about last lecture? They're growing what? They were growing what in dishes? Cells, right? Cells. So, whoops. I gotta get better with the button, like I said. Uh, the nice thing about these is you can look at the plates because you can put the plate right on there and have the light come up from underneath. Or you can also look at slides. The thing to keep in mind is on this microscope, you have the you know your slide with your cover slip. Your cover slip will be facing upwards towards the top. On this kind of microscope, your cover slip has to be facing downwards. So wherever the objective is, that's where the that is where the cover slip goes that direction, okay? Sometimes it's a problem here if the cover slip doesn't stick on, we'll put them on and the cover slip will fall off and be like, oh boy. Because the thing to keep in mind, at least on most of these biology type systems, you have to have a cover slip, okay? If you don't have a cover slip, the light will not focus correctly. You'll see an image, but it won't be that good, okay? So cover slips are very important to, to get a high quality image. Stereo microscope, this is for like, what, what I use this for all the time in my institution is we do uh, mice. You guys have mice here, you work with mice a lot? Okay. So what I use this for a lot of times, I, we do mice and like eye infections. We do a lot of mouse studies and mouse eye infections to, to mimic the human infection and, and try to figure out ways to, you know, to treat it and such. Or immunology studies using the eyes as a model. Like I said, I'm in ophthalmology and the nice thing about working on mouse eyes, or really any system's eyes, is you have a built-in control. You have you know, one eye you can do an experiment on, and you have the other eye right next to it. The other nice thing about the eye is you can see into it. It is the only tissue really in the body you can look inside with really no problem. Uh, because of the nice cornea, which I, like I said earlier, did my PhD on. You know, it's a clear piece of tissue. All of us right now are looking through a transparent cornea. Okay, So the, you know, a little bit of the side here, but the eyes are great model system to study a lot of different things. Okay, so like a stereo, you're looking at bigger things. Okay, so upright, inverted, stereos. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the nuts and bolts microscopes and how they work. If you want to look more into this topic, okay, I'm going to, throughout the course, I'll just throw up a lot of different websites and stuff that I have found that are very useful uh, to look into these kind of things. Obviously, I can't go through the whole website but uh, uh, this one, my class, the PU, is from Nikon. And it's a pretty good website. It does a good job explaining things. It has some uh, interactive tutorials. So if you're interested in pretty much any of the topics I talk about, this is a very good website to go to. OK, so enough of the math. Where are we at? Do you want to call it now? So then we'll start in the biology part. OK, so I guess we're going to do lunch. Sound good? Everybody happy with that? Okay, so we'll take a break here and we'll come back real quick up there here. That's too while I'm working on this and then I'll collect them when I'm done with this lecture, okay?
Okay. So all of us here have looked at the newspaper, right? So what does the newspaper look like? It's what color letter? Black. Black on huh? white. Okay. So black is, I guess, the darkest color. And white, in a way, is the brightest color. So if you put those two together, it's very easy to see, right? It's, so if you have like yellow letters on white paper, it's not as easy to see. Okay, so that's what we call contrast. And the whole idea of a microscope is you have to have some contrast to be able to see something. Okay. So, what we're trying to do is achieve a a very bright bright and a very dark dark. You put them together and then we're able to see something. So the easiest way to go about doing that in the microscope world oops, would be using a stain. Now, the reason we use a stain is it brings in a color and then that color is against that white background. So the same idea as newspaper where the black ink is against the white background. So with the stain, we can apply different colors and make it easier to see against the background. Okay? So one of the most common stains that you will see is called hematoxylin and eosin. And a lot of times you will see this referred to as H and E. H for hematoxylin, E for eosin. Okay? So when people come to my lab, they go, oh, I have H and E slacked. Okay. And this is very common in hospital pathology because it shows a lot of detail of the tissue and it's a very useful kind of stain. Okay. So, it's based on charge. It's based on positive and negative charge. The one hematoxylin carries a certain charge and eosin carries the opposite charge. So, if we look at DNA, what charge does DNA carry? You might have heard this in your lectures or lessons. Does it carry a positive charge or does it carry a negative charge? It carries a negative charge, right? It carries a negative charge because of the, the chemistry of the nucleic acids. Okay, it carries a negative charge. So what it'll be is then that the hematoxylin will stick to the DNA because if we look right here, this is one of the... Uh, one of my favorite tissues in the body. This is the retina. And the retina is in the back of your eye. This is what lets you see. So what this is here, this area here, is what we call the vitreous. This is where the light would come into the eye. It would hit these cells here, travel back here. These are what are called the rods and cones of the eye here. That, that it involves vision. So pretty much every single day of my life at work, I'm looking at retina, the back of the eye, in one form or another. Often from mice, sometimes from humans. But the reason I'm showing this slide is we said DNA, which is usually in the nucleus of the cell, carries a negative charge. So hematoxylin is a positively charged dye. It will be attracted to the negative stain. So what these are here, actually, all of these rows of these that look like black or dark purple dots, these are all nuclei, okay? So it's a great stain because this one will stain the nuclei and pretty much eosin will basically stain everything else or the two will get in combination with each other and provide these other colors in between. So like I said, in hospital pathology, like when you, if you, you know, like if you ever, if you ever have something wrong with you, they take a biopsy like a, a little piece of tissue from your skin or your liver, if they think it's cancer or if they think it's something else, then what they will do, usually almost the first thing they will do is they will do a stain like this. So the doctor can look at the morphology, which is the morphology is like the shapes of things and how they look to see if it looks normal, like this retina does, or to see if there's a problem. Okay, So it's a very useful dye. Uh, and the nice thing about it in terms of microscopy, it gives a lot of contrast, like we said, so you're able to see things. Okay. 
Now, as we go on the rest of this time, if I don't make any sense, like if you're really confused, please let me know, okay? Because I want you to be able to understand what I'm talking about. Uh, my wife has no problem telling me I don't know what I'm talking about, so you should feel free to have no problem telling me that I know what I'm talking about, okay? Okay, so there's a lot of other stains that we use very commonly in bright field or transmitted light microscopy, <laughs> white light microscopy. Because as you see here, the background of these is all white. Okay, so one we use is called periodic acid shifts. It's sort of like a pinkish, purple kind of stain. So any ideas what it might say? Okay, it stains, just like it says here, it stains carbohydrates, which are sugars. Okay, and the place you find carbohydrates on a cell is if you look at a cell, on the outside of the cell you'll have some proteins and you'll find sugars attached to those proteins on the outside of the cell. So what this stain does is it stains the outside of the cells like a pinkish or a purple where there's carbohydrates. This is often used for fungus because fungus, when it grows, it has a sugar coat, a carbohydrate coat on the outside of it. And that carbohydrate coat is able to interact with this dye and you're able to see the fungus. So if you look in the tissue here, might not be the best picture in the world, but these darker threads are actually fungus. And we do an awful lot where I work at, or used to, my, my old boss left unfortunately, but we used to do a lot of fungal infections in the eye and his lab actually used to come to India quite a bit because I guess you have many more of these infections in, in human eyes in India than we do in the United States because I think you have a higher percentage of people working in agriculture than we do. Our agriculture in the United States has become very mechanized. So we don't have many farmers anymore. We have machines. But here I think you saw people out working in the fields you know, they're digging in the dirt, hits them in the eye, they get a fungal infection. So his lab used to come here and collect fungal infection specimens to work on because we just don't have the, the patients in the United States. So he was over to India quite a bit, my, my previous boss. So again, the idea that stains the sugar in the, uh, on the outside of the fungus. In the kidney, you have uh, a lot of carbohydrates on the cells in the kidney too. So it's also a lot of times we'll look at kidney and we use this stain to, to delineate these uh, glomeruli that are called, like where the, the filtration of the urine and such takes place in the kidney, okay? And I do a lot of work with diabetes. Okay, diabetes is, uh, I don't know, is there a lot of diabetes in India? There is. So a diabetes usually is associated with obesity. Okay, from you know eating too much, and in the United States we eat way too much bad food, fast food. I don't know, do you guys have McDonald's and Burger King and pizza and stuff? I think the stuff I ate here at lunch is very healthy compared to that, you know, fast food we call it. So I've done a lot of studies measuring the changes in the size of these glomeruli using this stain. Okay, so. It's not only a good microscope stain, but it, it has a practical relevance that we can see these glycocalaxes, the, the sugar coat, and lets us see these cells very clearly in the kidney. So again, we do this a lot in diabetes. Because diabetes, at least in terms of mice and in humans, uh, really affects the kidneys quite a bit, affects the eyes, especially the retina. We have a big problem called diabetic retinopathy. As people get older in age and have diabetes, they tend to suffer blindness, okay? So again, microscope stains used for practical applications in the real world. Okay, now another one we'll use quite a bit is this one called Oil Red O. Uh, like the one here on the right, this is actually liver. And if you have like cirrhosis of the liver, uh, has anybody heard of that, cirrhosis of the liver? Okay. A lot of times people have these problems with they drink too much, too much alcohol. It's bad and it's very hard on their liver. So we'll do studies of looking at how much fat 
is being deposited in the liver, like fatty liver and just bad liver. And the, 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 the problem is, is we'll use this diet oil red oak that again, allows us a lot of contrast. Like it's very easy, if you look at this, to pick out where the lipid is. It's bright red. So it's a stain specific for lipid. And it's, it's very bright red and it's easy to pick out. So what we can do, and we'll talk about this after a while, is we can use image analysis. And we can actually say, okay, we have this much liver tissue here. Well, how much red is in it? So if I take a, a healthy mouse on one side, and I take a, a mouse with a fatty liver or cirrhosis of the liver, and I stain with this, and I set up my experiment correctly, I can see a big change in how much red is over here, fat, versus how much red is over here, not fat, okay? So there's ways to measure these things and quantitate these things. We'll get into that a little bit when we start talking about image analysis, okay? Which is a powerful tool that, that comes from taking the images off the microscope. Okay, another good stain. This one's called Mason's trichrome. Uh, another pretty colorful stain. We use this a lot of times to look at muscle, uh, to look at muscle wasting or whatever. Now this is this slide here is something that Sregis really likes. I don't know if he's here or not right now. But this is actually so with the Sregis study? Anybody? Huh? He studies hair. He studies hair loss, right? So actually what this is here, this is actually a hair follicle. This is mouse skin. Okay, so this would be your hair follicle here. This white area, this is fat. Anytime you see something that looks like this, like a, almost like a honeycomb, do you know what I mean by a honeycomb? Like that shape that the, the bee makes the honey in? Anytime you see something like that and it looks clear in a microscope stain, usually that would be uh, lipids or adipocytes, which are the cells that make fat. Now, if we would stain this same slide right now with the, the last one we looked at, the oil red out, well, this, because it's fat, would turn all red. Okay, but in this particular stain, it doesn't stain fat. It stains uh, keratin, it stains collagen, and it stains some other things. And the nuclei are very dark here. So, a lot of times what it is is you, you need to decide, hey, what am I looking for? What do I want to see? And you can use these fairly simple stains to, to get a good look at the piece of tissue you look at, okay? These things we really don't use for cells. I mean, I guess we could, but I mean, I almost never see cells with aging once in a great while, but very rarely. It's almost always tissue, and it's almost always biopsy, or it's almost always a section taken from mouse or human or something. So you'll see these stains, but almost always with tissue. Yeah. Does that all make sense? Okay. So let's say you're looking at a cell in a dish, and if you put a stain on it, it would hurt it. It would, it would just hurt it, and you couldn't study it correctly. So what do we do if we're looking at cells or something, and we don't want to stain it, but we want to see what's going on. We want to see it. Okay. So what we've come up with is another way, again, to make contrast. Remember that, the black printed ink on the white paper. So we want to take a cell, which basically is invisible almost. A cell by itself is pretty much just like a, almost clear, like a drop of water almost. Just a very clear, uh, a very clear object, basically. Very hard to see. Like if you just, put your microscope, turn the light up real bright, you probably won't see anything. Okay, so we have to come up with some kind of way optically to be able to see these cells are not stained. Now, does anybody here grow cells in like a tissue culture area? Anybody? anybody? Some of you? Anybody? No? Somebody? Somebody must, I'm guessing. Right? Okay. So, a lot of times you'll, you'll put the cells on a tissue culture scope, which like we talked about, the inverted microscope comes from underneath, then we'll look at the cells, and then we'll put something in the way to look at it, to, to interfere with the light in such a way that we generate a contrast, okay? Okay, so there's three 
main ways to do this in the, in the microscope world. There's three main techniques that we use to look at unstained cells for the most part. You can look at unstained tissue too, but usually we use this for cells, like in a tissue culture plate. Like if you ever looked at a tissue culture plate, if you just hold it up, you don't see anything because they're clear. Okay, so we have three main techniques we use. We have phase contrast, Hoffman contrast, and the Marsky DIC, which DIC means differential interference contrast. And we'll talk to all these in a little bit. But for any of these to work correctly, these three different techniques, the microscope, the white light must be aligned properly. It is critical. If you don't have the light lined up correctly, then it didn't work. Okay. A lot of microscope work is alignment. So we're going to talk about this now. Okay. So a long, long time ago, I think in the maybe the 18 something, there was a man named Kohler. He's a German. Uh, I couldn't find a way to make the little dots, like they make the little dots over the L, like a German, I think it's called a homelet or something like that, I'm not exactly sure, but it has a name like that. But this Professor Kohler came up with a way to line up an optical microscope, okay? So this is something, when you sit down, like I'm a, a biologist, but you know, I mean, I do microscopes every day, so when I first sit down, because I have lots of people using my microscopes, they have everything in different places. I will actually sit down, it takes about maybe 25, 30 seconds to do this, but this will properly, properly align your microscope. So, so everything you work with from that, from that point on that day will be okay. Okay, it's a very simple procedure. And you usually start with a low objective, like maybe a 10X objective. First thing is you put it up like something stained, something easy like a slide, like an H and E slide. You focus. It. So you just you're sitting there looking, you focus your specimen. Step one. Step two, on most microscopes, there's a little diaphragm, often a little lever. And as you close it, as you close that lever, you'll see like the light will get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay? It's called a diaphragm. It just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so focus the specimen, close the diaphragm. You'll see it. it's a switch, it's like usually a lever. And then what you do is you move this condenser here up and down, like depending on the microscope, if it's inverted or whatever. But you'll see this condenser. You move it up and down until the edge of that diaphragm. I wish I had something to draw on it, but whatever. But the edge will be very sharp and clear and focused. When you do that, then a lot of times a microscope will have tiny little screws on it and you can move that now sharp white light into the middle of the field. Like it won't be out here, it won't be over here, it'll be in the middle. And hopefully if we get a chance to work on the scopes a little bit, I'll show you how to do this. But right now I'm just gonna talk about it. Uh, so we'll center the condenser. And then the last step is, now we have this little hole with the sharp edge, we need to open that back up. And then once we've done that now, we have the condenser in the proper level, at the proper orientation, okay? This will make all these contrast techniques work. If you don't take that 25, 30 seconds to do this, your results will be bad. You will not take a good picture. It just, it just won't look right. It'll look sort of sloppy. So Kohler illumination, you know, like I said, we always try to give credit to these scientists of the past that did things that allow us to do our work today. So this is what it'll look like under a microscope when we do it, okay? So we've already done the focus the specimen here, okay? Then we close the diaphragm, like I said, and you start seeing this edge, okay? We put the diaphragm in the center of the field, and then we open it back up, okay? And the main step really is this, you'll see this edge get very sharp. You'll see that black white edge be very sharp, okay? So again, Kohler illumination to set up the white light part of the microscope, the transmitted light, not fluorescence that we talked about earlier, but the white light part of the microscope, okay? And a lot of times on an inverted microscope, 
the white light will come over the top. It'll be like an arm. It'll look like an arm like this, and the light will be shining down, okay, like that. And you just want to make sure you have that light lined up correctly. Okay, so let's talk about these three techniques. Phase contrast. Phase contrast is very cheap, very easy. Uh, a lot of times you have tissue culture scopes when you're looking at cells every day. And you know, that's the major functional lab. Srijit sent me a quote of his. He was thinking about buying a tissue culture scope. And I asked him, the first thing I always ask is, what is the application? He's like, well, it's looking at tissue culture plates. So by doing that, I knew exactly what to do right away. I knew he wanted probably a phase contrast setup. Because all phase contrast is, is basically in the path of light, it puts a little circle. Okay, and what happens is the light bends around that circle and it throws, and you know how light has waves, right? It has waves. Well, the two waves go out of phase. So instead of them being perfectly lined up like this, they come out of alignment and you get this contrast technique. You get this thing. So you can see then cells that are usually clear, you'll see this contrast and you'll be able to see them much easier. Okay, this is a very cheap, solution to being able to see cells not stain. I mean, these little rings cost like $25 or something. Okay. And the objectives have to be a phase objective also because there's another ring inside the objector. Okay, but it's a very cheap, uh, effective solution. Is it the best? Well, in microscopes, there's always a trade-off. One thing works better, the other thing will work worse. So I'm going to show you other techniques too, and you can tell me which one's the best in terms of how it looks, but then we talk about the cost, you'll go, well, is it really worth it, okay? So this is just how you line up the phase ring, how it would look when you line it up. There were two rings basically on top of each other. Hopefully, I don't know if this scope has phase or not, but if it does, I'll show you how to do all this. But it's just something to keep in, 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 uh, in mind. A lot of times with the tissue culture scope, that that's all it's going to do, tissue culture scope, it's, it, the way it's built, it's always in alignment. You don't have to do the core. It's just set up because they know you're going to do this all the time. It's already designed. It's engineered to always be in alignment. And you're just bringing the phase ring in. Okay. Okay. So this is a normal. I took this in my lab. Phase contrast image. So normally, like I said, these are cells. Normally, they would be totally clear. You wouldn't see a thing. But by using phase contrast, you get this kind of image. Now, the one thing you see is if you look around the edge, okay, we call this a halo, like a white circle around it. Do you guys know what a halo is? A halo? A halo? Like I'm Catholic, and like our angels, they have halos, like circles around their head, okay? So that's what we call a halo, like a white edge. So anytime you see a picture like this, you know it's fixed. But a nice, cheap, easy technique to look at cells that are not stained. Okay, DIC, differential interference contrast. Okay, love it. I, I really love the technique. The cells look very beautiful. Okay, I have it on my one scope. But when I bought my other one, I talked to the salesman and he said, well, yeah, sure, but $8,000. Okay, so $50 or you know, $50, $75 or $8,000. Well, hmm. Now, but the one thing about differential interference contrast is you can do it on a plate, but this always has to be done through glass. Okay, anytime you do anything on a microscope in, in a biological context, you are always going to get a better image looking through glass than plastic. Every single time. Okay, plastic, we talked about earlier, refracts the light more. It bends the light. It distorts the light. And it's thick. It's just, it's just not good for imaging. It's, I mean, it's useful to grow cells in. It's easy. It's cheap. I mean, plastic plates are cheap. But if you want a very nice, very high detail picture, you have to figure out a way to go through glass, OK? Like a cover slip or something else. OK, so what DIC is, the reason it's expensive, is you have all these polarizers and 
then we have another polarizer called an analyzer. You have all these different components to DIC to make it work right. So obviously, the more things you buy, the more it costs. Okay, it's very expensive, and you can get very pretty images, which I'll show you here in a second. But you know, is it worth it? Is it worth the money? Sometimes yes, sometimes not. Okay, so this is cells here with DIC now. You remember the phase when you saw these halo stuff, but these are almost like in three dimensions. You can see the fine details of the cell. It almost like, when you look at it, it almost pops out at you like it's 3D. I mean, it really looks very pretty and it's very nice. And then what we did here is we did a little bit of fluorescence micros microscopy with it, and we put the two pictures together and we're able to see like the, like, like what you talked about earlier, like the, the green fluorescent protein. So here we're able to see the green fluorescent protein in the cell where it's located. And then we're able to get the morphology of the cell from the DIC, the differential interference contrast. So here we're using two techniques. We'll talk more about fluorescence in the next couple of days. But the idea is we are looking again at unstained cells, even though there is some staining, but they're not all stained. So the DIC gives more of a 3D kind of look to the cells to let you see them. Okay? It's a very nice technique. I love it, but you know, I, I don't have $8,000. Okay, Hoffman modulation is a lot like DIC, but it will work on plastic. Okay, it's pretty much the same thing, but the companies, the microscope companies, you know, thought about this and said, well, you know, a lot of people want to work on plastic because it's cheaper. So they came up with this idea of Hoffman, where it will let you do it through plastic, but still the images aren't quite as good as uh, normal uh, DIC. Okay. The one thing they do an awful lot is in in vitro fertilization, they use Hoffman all the time. Now, in vitro fertilization is taking the, the egg, okay, and injecting a sperm into it to fertilize it, to start the, you know, the process of fertilization. Well, in these kind of labs, they grow lots and lots and lots of cells in plastic dishes because it's cheap, it's very economical, and you know, they need to be able to look, they need to be able to manipulate to, to bring the sperm in there to fertilize the egg and such. So this is a very common technique in an in vitro fertilization clinic. So if you go to an in vitro fertilization clinic, I had a chance at one point, I almost ended up doing my PhD in that, I didn't, but I got pretty close to doing it. Uh, the lab was full of Hoffman contrast microscopes. So that's really where you see that particular technique a lot. Okay, so here, Again, just to put them all side by side pretty much, this is like using a bright field microscope with a lot of little tricks just to try to see some contrast. And it's, you know, it's okay. Phase, much better. The reason I know this is phase is because of what, what do we call this white thing around the edge? The halo, right. And then DIC, you see that 3D kind of look to the cells, okay? So all techniques that let you look at cells that are not stained, okay? Very useful. I think your scope was gonna be a phase contrast, right? But when you're gonna get tissue culture, right? Because it's a, it's a, he's gonna use it all the time to look at his cells, and it's not ultra expensive. He doesn't need the, the DIC, plus he doesn't wanna work in glass all the time. So it, it's cost effective to use phase for something like that. We're just looking at cells all the time, and you're not doing any, you know, real detailed kind of imaging like we saw in the one with the the, the green fluorescence inside the cell. So phase is always a pretty good way to go for just a regular tissue culture. Okay, so I guess you've all probably looked at slides, right? Maybe, maybe not. Let's see what I got here. Okay. I put tape on so they wouldn't fall over the airplane. Okay, uh, let me just pass a couple of these around. Okay, this one is, I can't see, it's not real good for a microscopist, but when you get to the age of 50, you will have that problem also. <laughs> so, okay. So I think this is, I can't remember, I think this is I. But anyway, pass around, that's an H&E slide of I. This is a, uh, this is plant. Pass around, just take a look. So this is basically just different kinds of slides they have. Nothing special. Uh, here's another one. This one is again, I think H E and I. Everything I have is I usually, because that's what I work with most of the time. Okay? So 
Yeah, I think this one's uh, this one's called Lily of the Valley. It's a very popular microscope. Why I don't know. It grows in my backyard. So it's yeah, it's real pretty. Little white flowers, very pretty, very pretty plant. Comes up in the spring for a couple weeks. Uh, okay, but the reason I bring that up is we're just going to talk here a little bit about how you actually make the slides. Okay, there's two main ways. So what happens first is you're going to take the tissue. Okay, you know, mouse liver, mouse eye, human liver, human eye. I mean, whatever. Whatever the tissue is, you're going to take that, and quite often you're going to freeze it or do something to it before you actually section it to make it thin enough for the light to go through and to look at it. Okay. So like I said, there's two main ways to do this. The one is called cryo sectioning, and the other one is called microton sectioning. Well, cryo, does anybody know what the word cryo means? Cryo? Cold. Cold, exactly. Like the they talk about cryo preserve freeze preserve like you put things in you freeze it right so cryo is done in the cold we have a histology lab right next to my lab and the histologist i work with she does all the slide cutting for me and her and i work real closely together because we have to talk about hey we're trying to look at this or trying to look at that use this stain or i need them cut this way or whatever so her and i always are coordinating together to help people's experiments work correctly Okay, but there's two main ideas. Again, there's cryo, which is cold, and it's fairly easy, because a lot of times what we'll do is we'll take the piece of tissue and we'll put it in fixative. Okay, now fixative is like a preserver. Okay, it, it keeps everything in place. It, uh, it's almost like glue. It's like you take the tissue and you basically glue it and preserve it and keep everything right where it is so things don't move around so things stay right where they're supposed to be okay now when you fix things and we'll look at some protocols later on this week about fixing things it can cause some little problems like it can change the proteins a little bit in the tissue or it can change the lipids a little bit just a little bit I mean cryo is not very damaging usually to the cells but it changes it a little bit it's not perfect okay so a lot of times what we'll do and later on this week we'll talk about using antibodies to stain tissue and cryo is usually my first choice to preserve what we call antigenicity and what antigenicity is is the ability of our antibody to recognize something so it's less destructive to use cryo sectioning and making slides in the cold than it is to we'll talk about the other technique here in a minute so if you have an antibody that you've never used before and you're not sure if it's going to work or not chances are it'll work on a slide and using this kind of technique versus a slide using this kind of technique now the reason we use the microtome sectioning okay or paraffin embedding this one we actually take the tissue out just like over here Oops. just like we did over here but we do this at room temperature and then we actually embed the tissue in paraffin which is like wax okay so it holds the tissue all together because the whole idea of fixation is to preserve everything to keep it just like it was as best you can Okay, but you're using chemicals, so things you know, aren't quite perfect. But we put this in wax. And so what we have then is we have, like if you go to the histology lab next to me, you have all these blocks, they call them. And it's basically like an eye in a block of wax, or a liver in a block of wax. So we call them blocks. And what the next door to me, her name's Kathy, she'll take these blocks, she'll mount it here on the, on the microtome, and she'll cut them, and she'll get a ribbon. Like each time she goes up and down, she'll make a cut, make a cut, make a cut. And, and the wax is holding them all together and the tissue's in the middle of it. So she gets what's like a ribbon. So she'll yell at me, she'll go, you gotta get out of this room. And I go, why? Because she's cutting these real delicate ribbons. And if I walk past, I make like a breeze and the ribbon will go, right? So she's usually like, don't come here. Like, okay, okay, go. Yeah. So, 
So that's the other one. So she does this kind of cutting in the cold, which we call cryosectioning, and she does this kind of cutting, which is called microtemp sectioning, making a paraffin block. Now, once you have in paraffin, if you get ready to do the staining and stuff, and we'll talk more about this again when we talk about antibody staining, you have to get rid of that paraffin to be able to access the tissue to do something with it, okay? So the problem here is it hurts the, I guess, the conformation of the proteins more because you subjected it to all these various chemicals. We're here, just a little bit of chemicals. But the morphology is off the chart. The, the, the appearance of the tissue is great. And like I said, in microscopy, everything's a trade-off. This is better for antibody staining, but the tissue doesn't look as good, whereas this is worse for antibody staining, but the tissue looks better. You can't have everything. You gotta decide, do you want this or do you want that, okay? So it's always a trade-off. Okay, so antigenicity is, like we'll talk about this in a few days, but the, the idea of an antibody, like the antibodies in your body, so let's say you get a uh, infection for, let's say, E. coli bacteria. So the antibodies in your body will come around and in a very fine, three-dimensional, like almost like a lock and a key, they will recognize that particular protein on that E. coli. Okay, and that's what we call that, that area is the antigenicity, the, the thing the antibody recognizes. So. If, if that E. coli protein is like this, and the antibody comes in and grabs it like this, everything works, it sticks to it. But by doing these kind of techniques, that, that protein might be distorted like this, and this antibody cannot recognize it. So we have destroyed the antigenicity, the ability of the antibody to bind it correctly. So like I was saying, if you have a new antibody you've never used, I get this all the time. People come in, we'll talk about this in a little bit. I'm trying to get it to work. I'm trying to make this antibody work. I'm trying to do this staining. And they have paraffin sections. I'm like, wait, hold on a second. Why don't you cut some like this? Because there's a better chance it'll work. Okay. Questions? Okay. Okay. So I talked a little bit about cover slips. And cover slips are thin. Like you're looking at them now as you're passing around the slides. A little piece of glass on top. Okay. Now, it is beyond me why they sell other cover slips than the ones I'm going to talk about. Now, I'm not talking about the brand name, the thickness, okay? The cover slips you always want to buy, the size does not matter the, how big the square is or the circle is. It doesn't matter. This is really important, the thickness. 1.5 or 1.5 cover slips. That's all you should ever buy. The reason being, every single microscope company designs their optics to look through a piece of glass this thick. When it says 1.5, the specifications are 170 uh, micrometer piece of glass, okay? All the microscopes are designed to look through this piece of glass. And we'll get into a little bit later why this is so, so, so important, okay? But don't buy ones, don't buy twos. Buy 1.5s, okay, always. Why they sell the other ones is, uh, it just doesn't make any sense. I guess just to make money, I don't know. Okay. Okay. So, what was that? The thickness of the slide really doesn't matter so much because you're going to come through the top, through the cover glass. So the cover glass is everything, the thickness. The slide can be, I mean, it can't be, you know, ridiculously thick, but the thickness of the slide doesn't really play into much because you're always coming at that other surface, the cover glass surface. And we'll talk a little bit later about the actual dishes that you can come from underneath and, and it's actually built like a cover slip. So you can come from underneath and go through glass. Because like I said, glass is always better than plastic to image through, like night and day, okay? Okay, so I've been doing microscopes for a lot of years. Like my PhD, I did some, uh, but like hardcore microscopes, probably 13 years, okay? I still have trouble finding the specimen, okay? And it's the hardest thing. It, it, it is. It's the hardest thing is to actually find it to start with. So it, when you sit on the microscope here and you can't find something, don't feel alone. Okay. Now, why is this a problem? Okay. So if we look, if we have a microscope, 
okay, let's say it has a five times magnification, 10 times, 20 times, 40 times, and 63 times. Like I know the confocal here has a 63, and I think 100 times too. Well, when you first look at a specimen, you always, always, always want to start low. You want to start low magnification. Why? Because the area you're looking at at 5x is like this big. You're looking at this big area on the slide. So obviously, if you have a big area to look at, you have a better chance of finding what you're looking for, right? So at 5x, the circle's this big. At 10x, the circle gets smaller. 20x, it gets smaller. 40x, it gets smaller. 63x, it gets really, really tiny. And you're looking at just a very tiny part of the slide. So unless you're right on the cell, you're never going to see it. So always, 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 if you don't learn anything else in this course, start low, go high. Okay? That is just the key. Because people come over, they start at 100x, and I'll, you know, I'll be out having coffee or something. They, I come back, and they're still looking. They're going, you can't find it. It's like, I can't get started in my experiment. Well, you know, you got to start low, work high. Okay? So this is just showing that idea that at low power, you know, you have a bigger, whoops, you have a bigger circle, okay? So you have a big circle, low power, and then as you go up, the circle keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So always start with low, work your way up. Okay, another thing about starting low is, like, if you look at those slides, I mean, you're obviously not using a microscope, but you see the tissue, right? You see the eye. So if you're on the microscope, it's real easy to come over with the light of the microscope and say, oh, okay, I'm on top of that piece of tissue right now. I'm in the, I'm in the correct X and Y, okay? So, and I'll have people come over and they're like, well, I'm right on top of it, but I can't find it. Well, the reason they can't find it is they're in the wrong Z plane. So remember, a microscope, you have X and Y, the surface of the slide, X and Y, but focus is Z, it's up and down. So if this is my specimen right here, and I'm up here focusing up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, I'm never gonna find it in a million years. Same problem here, okay? If I'm down here, I'm never gonna find it. Okay, so as you go up in magnification, we have something called depth of field. And what that means is a lot of times it say maybe 10x, you look at a piece of tissue and you go, man, that looks really pretty. It looks just nice. Everything I see is in focus, and it looks really nice. Well, why don't I go to 20x? And I'll go to 20x, and that piece of tissue looks really pretty and really nice and really focused. Well, you know, I'm doing good now, right? I got a nice looking image of 10. I got a nice looking image of 20. So let's go to 40. So I go to 40, and it looks horrible. It just looks horrible. Especially retina. Retina is the worst for this. Why is that though? It looked good at 10, it looked good at 20, 40. Well, the reason is this. As you go in low magnification, it looks like this much is in focus. So you have this much Z that all looks focused. Like Dr. Sinai showed us earlier, he showed us those pictures where something was in focus but the background was blurry, right? So in low power, Everything's in focus, pretty much. But as you go up 10, you go to 20, you go to 40, you go to 63, that Z that's in focus, which we call the depth of field, gets smaller and smaller. So you've always got to start small because for two reasons. You're looking at a bigger area, easier to see, and then you have more focus at one time. So always, always, always start low and then work your way up. Never jump right to oil and go, oh, okay. It doesn't work, it just doesn't work. So how do we find something on the slide? Okay, if you look at some of these slides on pass around, like I think the one you have right now in your hand, it's got that white edge on it, right? See how it's got that white edge? Like a lot of times they have that just so you can write your you know, name it a sample or whatever on there. And oh, another thing, always write in pencil, okay? Because ink will smear, uh, you know, Sharpies, like you guys have Sharpie markers, the little Sharpie markers, 
alcohol, a lot of times will smear those right off. So if you're doing some kind of staining, like that paraffin staining or something, it'll smear off. So we almost always, always, always label our slides in pencil because pencil won't go away, okay? It's a good thing to use. But, so the trick I use, and I'm gonna show you right now, is like, if you focus on this big white edge, I mean, it's easy to see, right? And then actually there's letters here that say specimen. But if you focus on that big white edge, it looks very, very easy. It's a very big thing to find. And if you focus on that edge, whoops, and you come over, like here's a focus, I took this picture right before I left. You see that black white edge nice and focused? So when you move over across the slide now, you're on the surface of the slide. You're not above it, you're not below it, you're on it, okay? So I do this all the time still. I mean, I've been doing this for 13 years and I'm pretty good at finding stuff. But this little trick of finding the surface first in Z and then moving over will make your life much easier. You do this at low power, you move over, you find your sample. Because I'm telling you right now, finding the specimen is hard. It sounds easy, but it's not. It is hard. And it's still hard for me after all these years. Okay? So that'll pretty much wrap up this first lecture of mine. Uh, do we have any questions about anything I've talked about so far? Anything? Anything? Okay, I'd like to give credit, though, always to people who helped me. I took a course back in 2012 at, uh, up in Maine, which is a very pretty part of the United States on the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, great place, especially if you like lobster. I don't know. I don't, you guys don't have lobster here, do you? Or do you? You do? Okay. Like Maine has really big cold water lobsters. Like, oh, they're really good. But anyway, so we had this course there. And uh, these two gentlemen, I took some of these slides. I mean, a lot are my own ideas, too. But uh, I'd like to give credit to uh, David Piston and Simon Watkins, both, for uh, providing me with some of the information I use today. And then the website, MicrosPU, which is Nikon's uh, microscope tutorial website. And then I also used uh, Olympus's uh, microscope tutorial website. Okay, so that'd be the end of the first lecture. Uh, if we don't have any questions, why don't we just start passing those cards up to me? We'll take a look at them, and we'll take a couple minutes here, and I'll start the next one. Okay, or do we have to do something else here in between? Or do you just want me to start on the next one? Start. Okay, I'll collect the cards, and we'll start on the next uh, lecture.